following is a special presentation of HBO Sports. It's the Battle of the Ages. 12 rounds of boxing for the heavyweight championship of the world. This is a great event. George Ford. Pounds. Something that doesn't happen but once in a lifetime. And the Holy Fist, 208 pounds. It's my job to go out there and convince him that he cannot win. Stand by, everyone. Stand by, sound on X, Bob. Ready, X, A, sign will roll. Jim, I see this as a fight between George Foreman's 70s Cadillac. Mike, you rolling? A and execute. Here we go. A's good. And Evander Holyfield's 90s Corvette. If they collide, maybe the Cadillac can smash him up. Left, right, left, five, holy field. And the left and the right, and Foreman's in serious trouble. And if Ander stops punching, George gets a chance. And he's making the most of it right now. Round seven, a microcosm for the whole fight so far. Both men have their chances. And they're applauding George Foreman for his courage and persistence. They're on their feet. bring back the glory of so many years gone by. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this. An extraordinary display between rounds. The entire arena on its feet, cheering, stomping, and applauding both fighters. With Muhammad Ali watching at ringside. So many memories. So many of the relics of his past. Now here to pay homage as he takes his final shot. And now, from HBO Studios in New York, your hosts, Jim Lampley and Larry Merchant. Good evening. For the next two hours, you'll join with us in celebrating one of the most memorable and intriguing boxing matches in the recent history of the sport. First, we'll look at all 12 rounds of Evander Holyfield and George Foreman. Then both fighters will join Larry and me in analyzing what we've seen. We'll talk with them about their futures, and then you'll have your chance to ask questions of Foreman and Holyfield by calling our special telephone number, 1-800-873-7288. Larry, I think we've always known this was going to be an enjoyable evening, but maybe we didn't know how much so, because so few among us could have foreseen what would happen in the fight. Jim, we were smiling in the days leading up to the fight, and we've been smiling in the days since the fight, and that's a rare thing in prize fighting. George Foreman, by turning away every skeptic with unquenchable humor and by harmlessly hyping his bad eating habits, created a great event. Inevitably, his wit, wisdom, and the odds against him had almost everyone pulling for him. But given the emotional investment in him and the low expectations, there can be a tendency to magnify the actual performance of the favored underdog. So. Was Evander Holyfield always a step and a punch ahead and never in real jeopardy? Or did George Foreman come this close to winning the heavyweight championship, as he put it? View it or review it and enjoy. Thanks, Larry. And of course, as the evening progresses, we'll have ample opportunity to explore the complicated circumstances of the present and the future in the heavyweight division. Right now, though, a return to the recent past. Atlantic City, New Jersey, Friday night. April 19. This is the convention center on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey, where Trump Plaza plays host as HBO Sports presents World Championship Boxing. Tonight, undisputed heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield defends his title against former champion George Foreman. 
This 19,000-seat arena has been the scene of some of the most significant fights in recent heavyweight history. Among them, Spinks Cooney, Tyson Holmes, Tyson Carl Williams, and Tyson Spinks. Now it hosts the climax of a six-month publicity buildup, which has both glorified and satirized boxing, a publicity campaign which has grown into a metaphor for the battle you're about to see. Will the sleek, superbly conditioned champion step into the spotlight and knock this sport back to its senses? Or will the fat, Falstaffian, 40-something, former champ, steal the scene and leave us laughing once again? And as we bring you here into the arena, very close to fight time, the atmosphere is everything you would expect of an event which has once again stretched the limits of boxing's appeal to the general public. Larry Merchant, you always call it the theater of the unexpected, and here, before the fighting even begins, yet another example. Not too long ago, Jim, I would have just called this the theater of the absurd, but through the sheer force of George Foreman's personality, he's turned it into the theater of the wonderful. And I guess the lesson we get out of it is that old versus young and fun sells even better than good versus evil. But I've been amazed at every step of George Foreman's return, his transformation in personality, the persistency, four years at this. And now I'm even more amazed at the division in the expectations of the experts about this fight. Half of them don't give him any kind of a chance and the other half are picking him to win the fight. Indeed, one national newspaper polled seven former heavyweight champions, and six of them, among them the biggest names in the history of the sport, picked Foreman to win this fight. Whence stems this sudden burst of enthusiasm for the old man? Well, perhaps it's just a generational thing, Jim, but I think there's something else behind it. One, of course, is the fairy tale story of George Foreman's return, but also the mesmerization, the thrill that we all get from sheer power. And concomitant to that is that a lot of people aren't yet convinced that Evander Holyfield is a real heavyweight champion. And those are people that Holyfield might not even be able to satisfy exactly. with a devastating win tonight. But now, just before the fighters enter the ring, a couple of historical footnotes. George Foreman is not the oldest man ever to challenge for the heavyweight championship. Archie Moore was about eight months older when he fought Marciano in 1955. But if Foreman wins, he is, by a margin of five years, the oldest ever to win the title eclipsing Jersey Joe Walcott, who was 37 when he won the title from Ezra Charles 40 years ago. And now, to enter the ring first, the unlikely central figure in this six-month comic opera, which is about to become a savage drama, George Foreman. <laughs> Pasha actually is, Jim, but I think that's what George Foreman looks like. I never in my life thought I would support the incarnation of Muhammad in the build-up toward a fight, but George, every, every bit of that opinion on the fight have indicated that this crowd, like the rest of the American public, will be overwhelmingly in favor of Big March during the course of the fight. Will it be the last time, or will it be the biggest triumph of all? George Foreman, 69 wins, two losses, no draws, 65 knockouts. His 72nd professional fight in his second career. I'm not going to stop me like that.
And Foreman begins to do what he will do throughout the fight, try to walk forward. A little bounce in his step. Looks like an old guy about to go out for a jog, Jim. <laughs> Loosening up. And while George strolls about the ring, far off in another section of the arena, the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world prepares to make his slightly less heralded entrance. With championship belts. Eldrick Taylor, there is Mark Freeland, along with Lou Duva, and there is the champion himself. Taylor and Freeland, of course, were Olympic teammates of Holyfield's back in 1984 and have remained close friends, all of them under the aegis of main events, the New Jersey Corporation, which is co-promoter of this bout. is in a no-lose situation in this fight. Many people believe that the champion is in a no-win situation. If you can call it no-win when he's going to make upwards of $20 million. And I mentioned Freeland and Taylor there, of course, is the fourth member of the close four-person friendship. Brunel Whitaker, the undisputed world lightweight champion, at Evander's left shoulder. Just coming into view of the big crowd now and making his way toward the ring. Perhaps it's my imagination, Jim. I don't see that same hooded look of determination that I saw in his fight before Buster Douglas that look that said, I will walk through any amount of machine gun fire or howitzer bombs to get what I want. But you pointed out the no-lose situation for Holyfield. The dilemma, if he wins big, many will say he did nothing more than to beat up on an old man. If he loses, the sport's most finely conditioned and carefully prepared heavyweight will have been embarrassed. And by extension, some say all of boxing will have been embarrassed. Evander Holyfield has fought 25 times as a professional, most of those fights as a cruiserweight, 21 knockouts among his 25 consecutive victories. Hey, hey fellas, we're gonna have some room there, fellas. And of course, under that body is, or under that robe, I should say, is the spectacularly carved body has made Holyfield the force of this division. Jim, Jim, you wouldn't believe that he was called chubby as a kid. Tail of the tape, and you see, of course, the glaring statistic, the 14-year age gap. The 49-pound difference in weight is not the largest in heavyweight championship history. Indeed, there have been five other weight gaps that were larger than that one topped off by the 86 pounds between Primo Carnera and Tommy Loughran back in 1934. Here is George Foreman 17 years ago versus George Foreman now. You can see that he weighs 37 pounds more than he did when he fought Muhammad Ali in Zaire. And all other statistics except age remain virtually the same. And here's the difference between Evander Holyfield as a heavyweight now and Evander Holyfield as a rookie pro cruiserweight in 1985. 31 and a half pounds or 30 and a half pounds of weight difference and a slightly bigger body all over for a holy field. And here are our punch stat numbers to give you a profile of how active these fighters are. It's hard to say how meaningful these are under any circumstances, but certainly under the circumstances of two fighters who have fought vastly different classes of fighters. The jabs may be important because Holyfield has looked better, been more successful when he has thrown more jabs. As 
was the case against Buster Douglas. And now the rules of the International Boxing Federation, which is the governing and sanctioning body for this fight. Three judges scoring the fight on the 10-point must system. No standing eight count, no three knockdown rule. Neither fighter can be saved by the bell, even in the last round. And we go to ring announcer Michael Buffer for the pre-fright introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, Main Events Monitor Productions and Top Rank Incorporated, in association with the undisputed King of Beers, Bud Weiser, present the featured bout of the evening. This bout is sanctioned by the New Jersey State Athletic Control Board, Boxing Commissioner Larry Hazard Sr., Chairman Jerry Gormley, Board Members Gary Shaw and Richard Harrison, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Frank B. Dawkins. This bout is also sanctioned and approved by the World Boxing Association and the International Boxing Federation. The three judges at ringside scoring each round on a 10-point must system are Jerry Roth from Nevada, Eugene Grant from New Jersey, and Tommy Kazmarek from New Jersey. And the referee for this bout, working in a world title event for the 45th time from the state of New Jersey, is Rudy Battle. And ladies and gentlemen, at this time, two very special introductions. Two former heavyweight champions who faced each other 20 years ago in the battle of undefeated champions. They fought a total of three times, culminating with one of the greatest heavyweight matches, the Thriller in Manila. First of all, let me introduce to you from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He's the former heavyweight champion who always brought one of the most devastating left hooks in boxing history into the ring. Ladies and gentlemen, smoking Joe Frazier. three times in those three great bouts. In 1960, he was a gold medal champion in the Olympics. 1964, he won the heavyweight title. In 1974, he won it for a second time, and then he became the only man in heavyweight history to win the heavyweight championship three times. Ladies and gentlemen, three-time heavyweight champion of the world, Donald Trump's Trump Plaza Hotel Casino here on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, Let's get ready to rumble! It's the Battle of the Asians. 12 rounds of boxing for the heavyweight championship of the world. Introducing first, fighting out of the red corner, wearing the white trunks and weighing in at an official weight of 257 pounds. This 1968 Olympic gold medal champion won the heavyweight title in 1973. After a 10-year hiatus, he returned to the ring in 1987, and since then his record has been a perfect 24-0 with 23 KOs. His career record as a professional, 69 victories, 65 KOs, only two defeats, 56 of these KOs have come in four rounds or less, and he's considered by most experts to be the most devastating puncher in heavyweight history from Houston, Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenger and former heavyweight champion of the world, with multicolored trim, weighed in at an even 208 pounds. He's a member of America's greatest Olympic boxing team, the class of 84. He won a bronze medal that year, and he was the first of that great squad to win a world title as a professional. In only his 12th professional bout, he became a cruiserweight champion. And he is now 
in boxing history, the only titleist from that division to step up to the heavyweights and capture that crown also. Come on, baby. His overall on, record as a professional is 25 and 0, with 21 KOs. More than half of his KO victories have been in four rounds or less, and not one heavyweight opponent has made it to the final bell. And for the last five years, he's knocked out every opponent he has faced. We talked from about Atlanta, Georgia. High. Ladies and gentlemen, okay. presenting the undisputed, undefeated Come on. heavyweight champion of the world, the real deal, Evander. Holy deal. Is he with a drunk sir? Okay, look, all the way. I know, I know where. Okay, fine. Anything no, over I, there? I know where the belly button okay. is. Okay, gentlemen. You both received your pre-fight instructions in your dressing room. I expect a clean break at all times. Good luck to both of you. Let's touch gloves. Oh, oh, oh. Jim, I see this as a fight between George Foreman's '70s Cadillac and Evander Holyfield's '90s Corvette. If they collide. Maybe the Cadillac Let's go, can smash him up. But if it's a contest of quickness and youth, the Corvette has all the advantage. And in the closing minutes, just before the bell for round one, you saw Foreman bow, probably in prayer. You saw the little smile, almost a benediction, as he exchanged pleasantries with Holyfield in the middle of the ring at the end of referee's instructions. And now let's see. Is George Foreman for real, or is this the farce that many critics have said it will be? Holyfield feels that as long as Foreman has his arms crossed, he can't punch him. And he will try to punch every time Foreman does that. Remember that Holyfield's camp, notably trainer George Benton, loved the idea of going ahead and punching the arms and the shoulders and those areas that other fighters might not pick out as targets. He believes you can wear the opponent down that way. That left hook was short. Foreman steps in and lands a jab. Holyfield going to the body and connecting with a left and a right. Question one, is Foreman quick enough to hit Holyfield? No conclusive returns on that one so far. You see, we're seeing Holyfield more on the balls of his feet than we have before. Foreman using the jab now to try to set up some initial contact. Holyfield steps in with a right to the chest. Holyfield backing straight away from the jab. Now he steps to the side. Foreman has been able to block most of Holyfield's hard punches with the arms and elbows. As was the case there. his stamina if the fight goes into the second half. What we've had in round one is more a boxing match than a slugfest, and Holyfield has been surprisingly effective with the jab. An easy round for Holyfield. That's your point. Right? I got it. That's your point. Now listen. When you use the jab a little more, use the jab a little more. When it gets close to you, cut this. You have to cut this off too.
paisaje. Sí, Shipes is the man he listens to generally. Foreman held to his tradition, which has been the case throughout his comeback, of standing up between rounds in the corner. Holyfield landing a lead right, but George stands stock still and then moves forward again. Doubling up on the jab and scoring again is Holyfield. Now Foreman breaks out the jab to try to count it. The referee really battled warning both fighters to watch the elbows, particularly Foreman. Foreman oh! landed a left to the belly, and Rudy Battle says it's low. Warns Foreman to bring him up. Please. Holyfield continues to jab to George's big head. And Foreman lands a clubbing left, which may have been his most effective blow so far. Holyfield hooks to the body. I don't know whether Foreman is playing possum now, but all of his punches so far look like they've been sent by second-class mail. Very slow punches. And true to what he claimed he would do, whenever Foreman comes out of the crab-like defense, Holyfield steps up inside and tries to beat him to the punch. No running. He wants to get inside of Big George's power and pepper away. Chopping right hand right on the face by Holyfield. Foreman comes back with an attempted left and right. side of the head, a glancing blow, but, but Foreman's glancing blows can be hurtful. Well, indeed, Holyfield oh. dominated the first two minutes of the round, just as he had the first round. But in the closing minute of the round, George landed two or three of those clubs, and now Evander seems anxious to set things right. As we start out round, round three, and Holyfield's at a faster pace already. Foreman <laughs> beginning to open up. He's out of the crab-like defense most of the time now. Close quarters. But George. 
the body. What George Foreman has always had in his both careers is great presence, the belief that he he is the boss in the ring. And that communicates to his opponent. And you can see... Holyfield is still. stunned by a left and backs up two steps. You get the feeling, Larry, that George feels he's felt the best that Holyfield can offer, and it doesn't bother him. He's willing to open up and just come forward now. Banging to Evander's body.
before he took the title from Buster Douglas, the image of Evander Holyfield was that he couldn't fight a planned, disciplined, tactical fight. He is showing once again that he does he does he does use his head as well as his fist. Solid right hand at the end of that combination. Holyfield executing the plan now that he had discussed with us and with George Benton and Lou Duba, stepping up inside of Foreman's power and beating his man to the punch at close quarters. Fatigue. Harold Letterman, how do you see the first four rounds? Larry, I've got it 40 to 36, four rounds to none in favor of Evander Holyfield. To me, it's very reminiscent of the first fight between Michael Spinks and Larry Holmes. I think the Evander Holyfield strategy is the same that Michael Spinks used, and that is punch and get out, punch and get out, move in, throw your shots and get out. And Holyfield's been very, very effective, very effective in moving inside, landing two, three, four shots and moving so that Foreman can't hit him. Let's take a look at Holyfield's combinations, a straight right followed by a left, ties forming up. There you see it again. Punch count statistics indicate that in round four, Holyfield threw 39 punches and landed 27 of them. That's a 69% connect rate. Awesome efficiency. Not the kind of thing Foreman can compete with. He needs some kind of big blow to turn things around. And although it's only round five, for Big George, it may be getting late. Well, the question coming in here whether is whether George was a farce or Holyfield a fraud. So far, Holyfield has not been a fraud. He's fought a perfect fight. Becomes increasingly more impressive now with each passing round. The referee has told Foreman that that was the second warning. The next time he has to issue one, he will take a point away. For a low blow. For a low blow. successful in raising the referee's expectations with regard to that one thing. This is brilliant stuff from Holyfield, doubling up with the jab, coming with the right, the left hook to the body, rights and lefts inside. George gets in a straight jab and another. At some point, the question will be, how much of this does George want to take? He's a man with immense self-confidence who believes, because of his power, that he can turn the fight around quickly. But you wonder, as the rounds go by, whether he's going to say, I've had a great run, I'm making 12 million bucks, plus, thanks, folks, and goodbye.
stay there and move. Okay. You understand? So you stay there for the next punch. All right. Okay. Now don't let him hit you with those punches. Those punches take their toll on you. That was George's best shot, but it didn't have an awful lot into it. A right hand, that was a shoulder punch. There it is. Got It got Holyfield's attention. Maybe the first four and a half rounds have been a little too easy for him. Yeah, you wonder if Evander just lost concentration. Maybe he was getting a little bored with how easily things were you, going. You heard George Benton, his co-trainer, warn him to be alert and to get out. It's to said about Foreman that if he hits you, you'll be the deadest SOB in the cemetery. <laughs> 65 guys who can attest to that. And a lot of them did in the last couple of weeks. I said, keep them up. Nice and clean. Keep them up. Watch your head. Keep them up. Vicious right to the head and a left to the body by Holyfield, who reestablishes command here at the beginning of round six. Foreman steps in behind the jab again. tell you the truth, Jim, I'm a little amazed that Foreman, at this age, has taken some of the clean shots that he's taken without showing much hurt. Well, of and, course, he's the much bigger man, but then the chin doesn't know that he weighs 257, right? No, it's the same chin that was on him when he weighed 217. <laughs> Foreman clubbing away again as Evander Holyfield stops momentarily and gives him a chance. Now as Evander steps forward and punches again, if you're going to wait for Holyfield to get tired, you probably have a long wait, longer than 12 rounds. Several days. The way George Foreman used to fight, so tense and tight, he would wear himself out. But he is more relaxed now, and perhaps that's helped him uh, to maintain himself through this point in the fight. We're at the midway point, almost. Indeed, Foreman says that in his first career, he was nothing more than a wind-up toy. who had no options and no answers once the inner workings wound down. He sees himself as a whole different fighter now. Straight left, bothers Holyfield again, knocks him off balance for a second. George has been effective momentarily when he's been able to land the jab and step up behind him. Maybe Foreman's been able to take those punches because he's been doing nothing for weeks except eating and talking, so his jaw certainly must be in shape. Left hand landed for Foreman and rocked Holyfield back a little bit. Maybe there's still some thudding power in those blows. Right hand just misses, but the crowd gets excited. Holyfield comes back with a left and a right, both of them missing off the top of the head, but now he goes back to the body with good effect.
a slip. Canvas has been very slippery in undercard bouts. But now Holyfield stops punching and Foreman wails away again. There's a solid shot to the body in there. When Evander stops punching, George gets a chance. And he's making the most of it now. Salute George Foreman for the way he's 
gone about this, for his determination. He could have folded his tent and, and gone away, and everybody would have said, hey, thanks, George, you gave us a lot of laughs for four years, and we're glad you made a big payday. But he's still out here. Indeed, there were a lot of people who would have said that he had won big already just by virtue of stepping into the ring for this event. But we're in round eight. He's won big tonight again. Yep. years ago in Zaire that the Foreman machine ran out of gas. This has been a whole different enterprise. There's been no rope a dope here tonight. The Vander Holyfield has pressed back in the action all the way. Solid right hand. Foreman stunned again. Seven rounds to one favor of Evander Holyfield. The only round I see George Foreman win was the sixth because Evander stopped moving and George started to get to him with some of those clubbing shots. But Evander's shots are so much more frequent, so crisper, so sharper, with so much more velocity and snap. George Foreman said to his trainer as he came back to the corner, how many rounds is that? I'm going to still win this thing. Let's see. that it would have to be a knockout. Nobody in his wildest imagination could have envisioned George winning a decision anyway. Almost nobody thought the bout had a chance to go the distance. But I'm thinking of Emmanuel Stewart. Of all the experts who have been polled in recent days, he's the one who said Holyfield will win a decision. Holyfield's brain trust said, go out to win the fight. Just win the fight. If the knockout comes, let it come. Oh, 
seen so far, Jim. I don't think it would make any difference if Evander Holyfield weighed 190 pounds. The same thing would be happening. So the question's about whether he's a true heavyweight, at least as far as this fight will go. A solid he's right hand George. has stunned George Foreman. He can't be saved by the bell. He can't be saved by the bell, but he isn't going to go down on it. of these punches after that initial shot. Straight punches. Foreman is floundering, but he's a, he, with all those arms, he's a hard guy to find. It looks like Dempsey and Willard in that kind of an exchange. The smaller Dempsey, quicker all over the bigger lumbering Willard. George Foreman for his courage and for 
assistance. They're on their feet. Almost everybody in the arena standing up. Holyfield slipping and coming right back with his own. Just watch this. Slip, punch. Charlie Chipes is telling Foreman, try to straighten up that right hand. Try to throw it straight. some exchanges. If ever a fighter had the soul of a warrior, it's Evander Holyfield. Very hard for him to put it in the freezer. In fact, that's what worried his corner most, that instead of following the game plan, that his natural instinct as a warrior would take over. But so far, he's fought a perfectly disciplined fight. A brilliant fight against a big and courageous man.
attempt. Clubbing right hand by Foreman, just missed. A last chance to bring back the glory of so many years gone by. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this, uh, Jim. Uh, there's so much sentiment here because it's been a one-sided fight, uh, a virtually a massacre, as you as you would. Uh, Foreman has taken a tremendous number of hard blows, uh, but there is such a good feeling about him that everybody is uh, doesn't feel cheated, and feels thrilled to have been here to witness it. Not the painful bitterness of Ali Larry Holmes. Something much more satisfying. They didn't want to see George humiliated. They didn't want to see him as a fraud. They wanted to see him as a warrior, and he has shown that he is that. He has been, if outmatched, a legitimate opponent. to one, Evander Holyfield. I mean, the only thing I kept wondering was what was holding George Foreman up? He took so many vicious shots, left hooks, left jibs, right hands. He, Evander hit him with everything but the kitchen sink. And George Foreman couldn't hit what wasn't in front of him. And the key to the fight, in my estimation, was beautiful ring generalship, a beautiful game plan. Evander would get those shots in and move, step to the side, just get away from staying in front of George Foreman. And that was it. All right, here's a look at the punch stats. If you needed any more conviction about what Holyfield did, if anything, it looked like he landed about twice as many punches and Foreman landed about half as many. So, Jim Palmer went down, Mark Spitz went down, George Foreman goes down. And we didn't all run off with the circus. In but some, what a show. Yeah, in some way. Ladies and gentlemen, before I give the official scoring, let's have a round of applause for these two heavyweights. 12 rounds of exciting action. Nobody thought they'd do it. 
And now from the Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino here in Atlantic City, we go to the scorecards. Eugene Grant scores about 116 to 111. Tommy Kazmarek has it, 115 to 112. And Jerry Roth scores it, 117 to 100. For the winner by unanimous decision. And still, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, the real deal, Evander. So at the end of a fight whose legitimacy as a professional boxing match has been in question for months, there is plenty of affirmation to go around for everyone. Evander Holyfield scores his eighth straight victory as a heavyweight and takes another step toward proving his worth as a heavyweight champion of the world. George Foreman stands up to a merciless barrage and in doing so says that he stands up for senior citizens and Americans over the age of 40 everywhere. Coming up, we'll have a live discussion with both fighters in the studio. Champion Evander Holyfield will give us his reactions to the fight, and George Foreman will tell us what's in store for him next. You'll also see highlights and replays from selected rounds from the fight, and get analysis from both fighters about what happened. And later on, you'll be able to ask your questions to Evander and George by calling this number. So now we bring you to our New York HBO studio again. I'm Jim Lampley with Larry Merchant, and we have the privilege of being joined now by both of the Warriors in that spirited battle that you just saw. First of all, the undefeated and still undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, Evander Holyfield. Evander, thanks for being with us. Thank you. And, of course, the 42-year-old challenger who covered himself with glory in the eyes of almost everybody with that great and spirited effort. George, thanks for coming in. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Uh, Evander... You've had several days now to reflect on what you've done. You told us that this isn't the first time you've looked back at the fight. You've seen it several times. As you watch those 12 rounds, what do you see now that you weren't aware of during the fight? Is there anything that surprises you? Well, uh, you know, I took a lot of punishment and I was able to come back, but most of all, I did the things that George wanted me to do. George meaning George Benton. George Benton. Your trainer. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't do what I wanted him to do. <laughs> I wanted him to fall. <laughs> But I'm happy about the fight. It was obvious that for 12 rounds, I was the aggressor. Of course, I was fighting a very skillful fighter, a lot lighter on his feet than I had given him the uh, expectation of having. He moved. He was skillfully able to recover from the hard punches I gave him. All in all, it was a victory for every man who was 40, 50, and 60. It shows that, hey, you can bring it to a kid no matter who you are. He took it, but not because he was younger, but because he's a great fighter. You wanted him to fall. Did you ever think he was close to falling? A couple of times I had him on a hook, but he was a, they had trained him well to avoid being hit with three or four shots. Believe me, he was excellently coached, and he did a fine job. George, there's so much, and, and Evander, there's so much goodwill spread about this fight before and, and after that I thought you guys were trying to ruin the bad image of boxing. Don't you have to feel some anger and contempt for your opponent before well, a fight? Boxing is the granddaddy of all sports. There wouldn't be any ping pong without a boxing match. Believe me, it all started on that hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's never a shot in anger. Evander Holyfield is a fine fighter. We wanted to win. Nobody getting hurt. And fortunately for both of us, no one was hurt. But we won a lot of, uh, a lot of fans for boxing, TVKO, and hopefully for HBO. It was an even matched. We were evenly matched. The fight could have went both ways throughout the last round, even the 12 rounds. And so we give credit to the sport of boxing, the, the staff at HBO, and the TVKO. Thanks, the George. Evander, uh, did you feel anger? Do you have to build up anger against your opponent before a fight? We certainly don't hear it. Well, not at all. I feel that as a competitive sport and the nature is, is hitting each other, but the fact that it's been a competitor wanting to win is the motivation. And I, I feel that with George, I, you know, I respected George a, a great deal uh, for more than one reason. For one reason, because he believed in the same thing I believe in, that's Christ. And I think in this fight, it's a victory for both to show people that uh, it's not anger that when the fight is smart. All right, gentlemen, uh, let's move forward with some other business. We'll be back to talk to each other in just a little while. But right now, with the help of both fighters, let's re-examine highlights of the first six rounds of the fight. And as we look at this action, it's worth remembering that few of us in the arena or on press row now believe the first six rounds would look quite the way they did. 
Evander, after a relatively easy first round, George attacked you. Were you surprised? Yes, I was surprised with the speed of the left jab, which got uh, got him started with the overhand right, in which uh, uh, he had the momentum. It was hard for it was hard for me to stop the momentum. I was trying to consistently land that overhand right. Didn't matter whether I was hitting it, he was hitting me back or not. But to keep that right hand coming until he started bowing down from my lower uppercuts and things of that nature. Plus, he was moving a lot quicker than I expected out of him. And that made it difficult for you to get in that one extra punch that That's Mike right. Started. If I had to do all over again, I would have came in a little lighter. I can straighten that right hand a little bit. But I was, I had to throw an overhand right consistently this time. Round three, Evander, you delivered a message of your own at the end of the round. Describe it. Well, I was trying to get respect right there, and I, I showed George I had the power. I felt that I had him hurt, and I, I thought I had him out. But George was very strong. He kept pushing me and getting me off balance where I couldn't connect with the shot that I needed to connect and take him out. Now, he surprised me that, that uh, right hand he threw was reminiscent of an old Joe Lewis overhand right. It was real quick, a lot quicker than I expected, but I knew I could weather that storm. You did, and in the fifth round, you went at it again. Describe it. Yes, yeah, back to the old overhand right and coming in with a short hook. I realized he was avoiding my right hand, but if I could get a short hook afterwards, which he wouldn't allow me to get three punches in a row. But it's back to the overhand right, constantly throwing it, overpowering him. The champion is the champion. Well, gentlemen, let's look at the scorecards up to that point in the fight. All three judges split the first three rounds two to one for Evander Holyfield. One of the judges gave each of the next three rounds to Holyfield, two of them giving the fifth round to George Foreman. So after six rounds at the midway point in the fight, Evander Holyfield had a lead on all three scorecards, but not so much of one that George wasn't in the fight. Evander, before the fight, most observers believed that if the fight went a number of rounds, George was going to wear down. At this stage of the fight, did you believe that at that pace he was going to wear down and that you'd get a chance for a knockout? Well, actually, I was hoping that he would wear down. Uh, a lot of time, I, I got in there and got George swinging, and I realized that once I got him started, it was hard to stop him. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was just hoping in later round that it would pay off for me. George, I'd like to elaborate on that weight. Do you think you would have done better being closer to 240 than 260, and why? I went up in the weight purposely so I could bring it to him and have a lot for him to push and shove on. But now that I've looked at the fight, if I had a chance, and hopefully I will have a chance for a rematch sometime in the future, I'll be lighter. That way I can get that right hand in there just a little quicker. Of course, he's got scheme up his uh, sleeves also. But realistically, the weight was fine for me that night. I wasn't tired at the end. I was standing strong. I never sat down on the stool. Uh, the corner people were great to me, and I was able to receive instructions and carry them out, even in the 12th round with that straight right hand. And that was kind of hard to do when you consider how fast Evander Holyfield is. Well, you fought at 257. How much lighter would you have wanted to be? Uh, at least 235. If, mm -hmm. you know, if I would, had known that he was so evasive as far as a right, straight right hand was concerned. You said the magic word, rematch. We'll get back to that a little, a little later. Evander, were you expecting him at any time to launch out an all-out attack? Just, just out of frustration or the need to finally get you in the second half of the fight just to try to swarm over you? I was hoping to get him to that point. I was using my jab, and I was trying to build up the points where he can get reckless. And a lot of time that he, uh, George surprised me. He kept his composure throughout the whole fight, and he, he did the things that I guess his corner wanted him to do. All right, gentlemen, let's go back to the fight, and we're going to turn our attention now to highlights of the second half of the fight, beginning with its most competitive and perhaps its most dramatic round, round seven. In the future, this is the round we'll remember most. Both of you had big moments in the seventh round, Evander. What was your strategy right there, not throwing any punches at him? Well, right now, at this time, uh, Joe got the momentum. I'm not trying to break it because I wanted him to get tired punching as long as I can be able to block the shot. And hopefully, once he get tired and trying to catch a second win, I can start back with my combination, and I was able to do it. I'm just thinking land punches, get some points, get in there. If I can get an open for a big shot, I can get a knockout. If not, keep this guy moving back. Don't give him any more courage. He's throwing a good left hook to the body. Right now, I'm, I'm able to hit him uh, constant, and I, I hit him 17 unanswered punch, punches, and I couldn't see why he wasn't going anywhere, so I had to step back in the group. 
Yeah, I knew for a fact that he had carried guys down on barrages like that earlier, and I figured if he could give me that and not take it down, he would get discouraged in the corner. But thought, were, were you wearing down at all? Now we're in the ninth round, another big round for you, Evander. Yeah. Were you wearing down, George? Not at all. He was using his quickness. Of course, he had that advantage because of the, the lighter weight. He was quick, and I was letting him do that so I could get underneath his left jab with a, maybe a right hand, uh, left hook or right hand under his left jab. But he was a lot quicker than I expected, and I couldn't get off. But as a rule... Well, you hit him with a really terrific right in there, Evander. That was your home run. Well, I hit him with my, my best right hand. The jar was so big, he was able to push me back and get me off. He's telling you to throw the straight right hand, George. You That's right. This on a your third mind? right hand that we practice all the time. I finally got it over. I should have started earlier, but he was a little too quick for a straight right hand. I was doing the overhand right. He, recou you... he recouped so well, though. At this point, I was trying to get one more right hand. Were you determined here basically to finish the fight, George? Not at all. I was still looking for that straight right hand to get him, not just to finish to win it. I'm trying to land the last few punches, last few uh, rounds, and to get it going. And now the official scorecards for the second half of the fight. All three judges giving Foreman the seventh, despite the rally by Holyfield, and two of the judges giving Foreman late rounds. But George had a point deducted in the 11th for low blows, and that helped to contribute to the final margin by which Evander Holyfield retained his title with a unanimous decision. So in the fight in which few people expected the judges to have to make a decision, it was a unanimous decision for Evander. Was there a point in the fight when you thought to yourself, well, my gosh, we're going to go the distance here? Well, after that 20-punch 20, 20 combination I, I hit George with, and I had to pull back and regroup, I knew that George had more than himself behind him. I knew that George had to have a lot of prayers behind him because I hit him with everything I had. And so had to go back and say, well, I'm just out boxing. That combination would have knocked out mm -hmm. any other opponent you've ever been in the ring with? I felt like it would have. I'm like, it's not many times you get a chance to hit uh, anybody 20 times consecutive and not get hit back. And, and I was planning. George, you mentioned the magic word a while back, mismatch, uh, rematch, I should say. Does that mean you've already decided that you will return to the ring? Not really. It's left up to my wife and my family. When you go 15 rounds, of, of course, I was a customer going 15 rounds. 12 this went in 12. this case. This went 12. And the judges render a decision. It's like a beauty contest, Miss America. It's a matter of opinion. And uh, he won the fight by way of an opinion. I think, given another chance, if my family permits me, I could win that thing. Of course, I'd give him a little more respect next time, try to win the fights earlier get a get a hit on and around so he could come to me i can get a knockout what, but there's no doubt in my mind i could do it what are the factors you're weighing what kind of offers do you have outside the ring what kind of offers do you have to fight again but basically i'm a professional boxer by by trade of course i'm a preacher i moonlight as a boxer but realistically no matter what offers you get you consider being a boxer or you don't consider being a boxer i came back in the business to be a boxer and uh there are a lot of offers out there but realistically i'm seeking boxing opportunities if i decide to stay in the business nothing else important only marvin hagler has ever walked away from a huge payday that he could have gotten for a rematch with but Sugar Ray Leonard. can you walk you away cannot, can you? it's not about paydays it's about making sure that you leave out. The last round, the champion grabbed me, you know, and I had a few more punches left. Do I want to walk away with that thinking, hey, if it had been a 15-rounder like I'm accustomed to, could I have won? Maybe not, but maybe so. Do I want to live with that? Do I want to give it another year and try again? I have to consider that. When you walk out, you want to walk out with all questions answered. I have a chance to do that. I'm still basically a young man. Everybody out there better realize mm -hmm. from this point on that 40 and 50 is not a death sentence at all. You can still dream. All right, let's talk about uh, another potential extraordinarily big payday. The boxing public wants to see you defend your title against Mike Tyson. When and how is it going to happen? Well, I look forward to it. And uh, I guess as soon as 
uh, Don King and main event can get together and and pull everything together, then we could possibly have a fight in this year. All right. Let's uh, look ahead for just a moment. For those of us who cover the sport, April 19 has set up an intriguing list of questions to be answered in the months ahead. Right now, with an eye towards some of the other fighters involved, a brief look at our view of the heavyweight division's immediate future. So we look ahead into the heavyweight crystal ball. What's next for the 28-year-old champion, Evander Holyfield? He'll take some time off, then return to his rigorous training routine, where attention will now be focused on Mike Tyson. If Don King, Shelley Finkel, and Dan Duva can come to terms, there is reason to believe Tyson and Holyfield could meet in the ring as early as this fall. The brawls between the ropes now take a back seat to the politics and painstaking negotiations among warring promoters and managers. Wait and stay tuned. And if Holyfield and Tyson can't agree to terms, there's a trio of unbeaten young heavyweight contenders standing by as Holyfield's management considers the likes of Ray Mercer, Riddick Bowe, and Tommy Morris. The recent performances of those three potential challengers are sufficient to demonstrate they may not be ready for multi-million dollar fights. All of them appear to need more seasoning in the ring, more marquee value outside the ropes. The guess here is that those three will serve as opponent insurance should Tyson negotiations break down. Talks continue regarding a possible Mercer and Morrison match this summer. That would position the winner or Riddick Bow for a fall title shot with the champion. All three are physically bigger than Holyfield, and that alone may tempt their managers. As for the undisputed champion, he stands and waits. And what about 42-year-old George Foreman? Will he retreat to his homes in rural Marshall and Houston, Texas, passing his days with a fishing rod or chopping down trees rather than opponents with an ax? Surely George will continue his role as preacher for the church he founded in Houston. But will the boxer George Foreman now retire? Or will he try to recapture those unforgettable moments of April 19? There has been talk of a match with a lesser opponent, a megabuck match with Mike Tyson, or a possible rematch with Evander Holyfield. Let's turn to Evander Holyfield and start with the subject of a rematch. Would you consider a rematch with George Foreman? Well, you know, yes, I guess. I, I feel that, um, you know, I gave him the first opportunity if I guess George feel that 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 wasn't enough. Because with my feeling, I was hoping that he wouldn't fight him again because of the fact that he did so well. And in this fight, I felt that both of us won. We both proved the point. And but if it came down to a, a rematch, then I'm pretty sure I would. Yeah, let, let's let's uh, be clear about it, that it's difficult to have rematches under the present rules. You would have to defend your title once before you would have a rematch. The thing I'm curious about, George, is this. You came out of this fight saying, I've never felt so much pain after a fight. You've become almost a national treasure. You're in, you've endeared yourself to America. Why would you want to subject that endearing head to more punishment in the future? Well, first of all, you got to look at yourself not as an old man. People today, 40 and 50, they're going to have to do a, a lot of pain. They're going to have to have pain of unemployment, seek other professions, and start all over again many times. And it's going to happen all, all the way up until they're 60 and 70 years old. My trying to avoid pain is going to be like trying to walk outside when it's raining and not getting wet. Sure, I can take the pain and keep going. What's wrong with that? You can't shield you from it. Well, George, let's forget about him. physical punishment just for a second. You have the extraordinary situation here of having the lost a fight. The only pain I endured is I had to stop eating ice cream before the fight. <laughs> you can eat all you want right now. And, and why get that? That was the greatest You pain. woke up Saturday morning after losing a fight a bigger hero than ever before. You'll sacrifice some of that love and respect that the public now offers to you if you choose to go back into the ring. Does that matter to you at all? Look, you make friends out there. People are your friends forever, so long as you do what you want. If you're in America, you don't enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you may as well be in Russia somewhere. If I want to do it, 
people are behind me. America is the country of you do what you want to do. That's Mark. what it's all about. You've got to dream. If you can't dream, die. Of course, one of the biggest questions about a possible rematch between these two fighters is how would a sequel to Foreman Holyfield ever live up to the original? Now we're going to turn to the portion of the program which is for you through the vehicle of a special 800 number, which is 800 873 7288. We're going to make it possible for all of you fight fans there to ask specific questions of these two fighters, George Foreman and Evander Holyfield. And we warn you in advance, what we're looking for here is a give and take. We appreciate the fact that many of you may want to congratulate either or both fighters or offer your thoughts on the great fight that they took part in uh, on April 19. But what we want to hear are your questions for either or both of the fighters. We're going to take our first call from East Northport, New York. East Northport, you're on the air. What's your question? Hi, my question's for George Foreman. Yes, sir. What made Evander such a difficult opponent? His speed or his ability to take a punch? What made him a, a, a difficult opponent was his ability to absolve punishment quickly and react again. I've never been in the ring. Probably Muhammad Ali was the only guy who was able to take a good solid punch and then come out of it real quick. That makes him a great fighter. Probably number two in my book. Number two in your book all time with regard to his ability Let's to take a punch. Code number one. Let's put it like that. Code <laughs> number one. Code Fantastic. number one. All right. Do we have another telephone call? We're going to go to Lubbock, Texas. Uh, let's open up Lubbock, Texas, and see what that question is. Lubbock, you're on the air. Yes, I have a question for George Foreman. Before the fight, Muhammad Ali went up to you and talked to you a little bit. I was just wondering what he said and if he warned you not to punch yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> it's strange, but he walked up to me. They introduced Joe Frazier. Then they introduced Muhammad Ali. I kept thinking, am I supposed to get out of the ring now? Because <laughs> I felt like my contemporaries were leaving me in there by myself. But he actually whispered in my ear, I'm praying for you. <laughs> and which was nice, I think. What did he say to you, Evander? <laughs> he said that I, he told me before me. <laughs> so I, I kind of had that feeling he was telling George the same thing. <laughs> Muhammad Ali is for everybody. <laughs> All right, let's go to the military town of Fayetteville, North Carolina, and put Fayetteville on the air. What's your question? Uh, yes, I got a question for Evander Holyfield. This is Fayetteville, Georgia, by the way, uh, on a Corvette shop down here, Evander. Oh, Fayetteville, Georgia, not right. Fayetteville, North Carolina. Sorry about that. Evander, we want to know, uh, how does it feel to win a fight when the crowd and everybody was pulling for a fighter like George Foreman? Well, um, I guess going in there, if they were behind me or George, I felt that George was a sentimental favor going in. But uh, it didn't bother me, and the only thing I wanted to do is get the opportunity to go in to do my best. Evander, uh, did you hear the chants of the crowd in the late rounds, George, George, George? Yes, I, I think they were very disappointed in me holding him, uh, but I, I realized I wouldn't let the fans cause me to lose my fight because I, I knew that George was looking for the big shot, and I felt that by me holding on to him would, would kind of like frustrate him a little bit because he really didn't want me to be close at that point in time because the time was running out. Was Did this the most tactical fight you ever fought from start to finish? I felt that it was because I felt that George had the power in a given time to turn the lights out. And I just didn't want to get so far down the road and um, start making mistakes and, and get counted out. George, did the crowd help you at all? Did they boost your spirits? You better believe it. I needed them. <laughs> First, they threw the water on me, put the ice on my back, and I said, I need something else. Then they said, Foreman, Foreman. I said, that's what I need. <laughs> all right, let's go to Blackshear, to Georgia. Also. Let's see what the caller from Blackshear, Georgia wants to know. Blackshear, you're on the air. Blackshear, Georgia. Are you there? All right, let's try another telephone call. We have somehow lost Blackshear, Georgia. Are we ready with another telephone call? Uh, now, nah, let's try uh, Byron. Uh, is that Byron in Blackshear, Georgia? No, it's All Rory. Right, go right ahead. You're on the air. Uh, it's Rory in Blackshear, Georgia. Rory, okay. Okay. Am I on the air? Yeah, you are. What's okay. your question? I'd like to ask George, are you satisfied with going 12 rounds with the champion, or is it still the belt that you're thriving after? I still would like to be heavyweight champ of the world. I didn't come back for a decent payday or the Cadillac in the window, so to speak. I came back for the heavyweight title. And if my wife and family permits me, I'm going for it again. I'm going to spend a whole year out there until I get the championship of the world. Like I say, me going 12 rounds and the, the scores go one way and another, that's a matter of opinion. And knock me on the floor. Beat me up. Then I'll quit. But if you can't do that, I'll be here. Now, Evander, don't, don't, 
Don't hit me now. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm enjoying what I'm doing. It's a ha I'm having a wonderful time being my age and being productive. I made at least $100,000 for that fight. I think you made a considerable <laughs> amount more than that, George. Let's go to Byron, Georgia. We have once again uh, a call from the great state of Georgia. Byron, are you on the air? Yes, sir. Uh, so my question is for heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield. Uh, Evander, could you tell me, were you as mentally prepared for your fight with George Foreman as you were with your fight with Buster Douglas? Yes, I were. Um, um, I look at each and every fight as um, a big move for me, and I, I hope to get better each and every fight. So I had to be more in tune with my mind for George than any other fight because it was a, a, bigger, ta a bigger task. George, uh, looking at it from his point of view, isn't it uh, unusual for a fighter who has achieved his life goal of becoming champion in his previous fight, and now he's fighting a 42-year-old guy to be able to summon that same what, what, kind of intensity? What you're going to have to understand, 42 and 50 are real respectable and honorable ages these but, days. But from his point of view, you've made no, it no, respectable. No, no. His point of view and the world's point of view, you're going to have to start looking up to senior citizens. We are productive. Not only do we buy and pay taxes, we can actually produce and people, and we physically are able to meet any challenges that are put out to us, as with that Swaskov fellow over there. You, we can do it, and people are going to have to look that gray hair means nothing, but you got 12 rounds to go. <laughs> you know, and uh, falling out hair and uh, beards and uh, whiskers means nothing anymore, but hey, I've got a rough night, and we, we painted that picture, and I'm happy about it. Let's see what's happening in the boxing heart of Anniston, Alabama. Anniston, you're on the air. What's your question? Uh, yes, I have a question for Evander Holyfield. Uh, my name is Rick. Uh, Evander, I want to know if the punches that uh, you hit uh, George Foreman with, uh, don't you think those punches will uh, knock Mike Tyson out? I really couldn't. I think it would have knocked anybody out. It didn't knock George out. I could be wrong. Uh, um, shots like that, I hit other people, and they have went out. And the fact that it showed that George was a very determined individual that night. and. Um, and I hit him with 17, 17, uh, 20 at one time. Mm -hmm. I found myself hitting with two at one time, still couldn't get him out of there. there you at, know, there's at a one theory. time he slipped. He counted. Yes, he my slipped right in the hand. corner. No, he counted my right hand and hit me straight in the face with the same shot he hit Buster Douglas with. And he knew it was right on time, and he knew it was the right shot. Bam! And I looked at him and said, well, let's go. And he said, <laughs> now what? You're proud, so, you're proud of your chin, aren't you, George? No, not, not being hit by his punch, but he hit me, and it, it was the right punch, it was the right everything, but it just so happened that at 42, I'm still a growing boy. <laughs> hey, Vander, you, uh, you say to us that you have the capacity to fashion a slightly different fight plan for every fight according to the opponent. What are the specific challenges, we know it's long down the road, but what are the specific challenges you think Tyson presents to an opponent? Well, I, I think uh, if you can get by, uh, get, get by the pressure that he put on, I feel that as all the fighters, he wanted a fighter that really don't give you any, any time to move. And I feel that just as Buzz Douglas did, was able to get a respect and get him not to rush up on and you can catch him coming in. All right, let's go to Cleveland, Ohio, and see what they're thinking about there tonight. <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio, you were on the air with George and Evander. Hello, Tom Tills here. Evander, have you ever encountered a more stronger um, granite chin than um, George Foreman? Did it shock you? No, I haven't. Uh, not at all. I, you know, I've fought a lot of different people in the point of my 20-year career, and uh, I never, ever in my life hit somebody with shot, and I would plant it. And I, I was planted, I was dug in, and I threw everything I had that night. And you know, I, you know, I thank God that he did stand up because it, what it did is made both of us a winner. Maybe if I would have got him out early, then we wouldn't be here today talking about how great the fight were. You've seen a lot of fights, Larry. Are you surprised, knowing what you've known about George from his career going back to the Olympics in 68, that he didn't go down in the face of this? I think I was a little surprised, but I think the ability to take a punch is, is, is largely a mental thing. And it was obvious that George was so determined in this fight that that's what kept him coming back, just as it helped Evander uh, come back. What, I was, what I'm curious about, Evander, is that now that you're fighting bigger men, real big heavyweights, do you see yourself in a different light as a heavyweight, that now you're going to have to be the boxer-puncher 
instead of the aggressive guy you've been in previous fights before the Douglas fight? Well, you know, uh, when my career first started on, I, I started off as a boxer. When I met Lou and Joyce, they wanted me, wanted me to be more of an aggressive fighter because I was stronger than all the light heavy and the cruiserweight. When I found myself moving up to the heavyweight, I found myself running into different problems, meaning that the heavyweight was a lot stronger and I had to, st I had to pull back and start using my boxing technique. And so, you know, as my career bloomed, I realized that to order, to order to be successful, I'm going to have to be smart enough to be able to know when to get in there and fight and know when to get out. All right, let's go to the neighborhood. New York, New York, with a question for one of the fighters. New York, you're on the air. Yeah, this question is for the champ. Evander, has anybody ever hit you as hard as George did? No, not in a long time. I, I feel that uh, George is, is foremost the strongest fighter I ever fought. He's the only guy that I, I hit and knew I hurt, but was able to still push me backwards and get me off balance. And, uh, and that shows that the determination and the drive that he had. George, uh, it was part of the strategy, was it not, to be able to push Evander and move him around the ring with your forearms and occasionally with your hands. Were you successful in getting him off balance? I was totally successful. What I didn't anticipate was that he would stick to his boxing tactics. You know, hit me with a good shot, I hurt him and then move out of the way. Hit me with six and then move out of the way. I didn't anticipate him constantly doing that. I thought he would revert back to trying to slug it out with me. But then again, I wanted every young man to look over at his dad about the 10th, <laughs> 11th round and say, Dad, I didn't know you could do that. And I wanted to stay there and take everything he had for the sake of every young boy watching it with his granddad. Well, as, as a fellow 42-year-old, let me assure you that I looked over mm -hmm. at Larry in about the 10th <laughs> of the 11th round. <laughs> See, I don't want to be part of Larry. <laughs> Larry hey, let's go bite. back to the subject of your chin for just a second. Some of the writers and columnists who are following up on the fight are saying that you showed a change in character. You showed a step forward in your personality because you hung in there and took the punishment and you stuck the fight out. I was not holding in there. I had some points up on that. Oh, yes, Lord absolutely. Knew. And uh, you got to understand if there was a chin tested, it was the great Evander Holyfield tested. I was the bigger man. I've got the 65 knockouts. He took those punishing, punishing punches and came back, and I hit him with good straight right hands, punishing left hooks. He took it. If anyone wants credit for having a great chin, it's not George Foreman. I was the big guy. He has the credit. He needs to take the credit for that. That chin of mine is just normal. Normal. <laughs> Let's go to Mobile, Alabama, and see what the question is there. Mobile, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, my question is for Evander. Uh, what is there that would stop a Holyfield Tyson match from happening? Well, Don King. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing. It's stopping it right now. Uh, I'm looking forward to fighting Tyson. I'm sure Tyson's looking forward to fighting me. And what Don King got to realize, I'm the champion right now at this time, and, and there's no reason for me to run behind Tyson. And if, if he want to give Tyson the opportunity to be a champion again, then they have to come my way and negotiate uh, the contract on fair terms. What do you, you, what do you mean by fair terms? Well, uh, when I mean fair terms is what the rules and regulation always stipulate. The champion, uh, the champion get uh, two-thirds, uh, 75 percent, and the chance to get, uh, you know, a fourth. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to doing what's supposed to be done. But and isn't Mike Tyson really a big draw? Wouldn't he help to create a gigantic purse? And shouldn't he deserve more than the normal challenger? Well, you know, I, I look at it this way. Uh, when Tyson was when Tyson the champ and I was the challenger, I was a draw as well. But uh, Don King told me I couldn't draw flies to a picnic. And, and I was, with me, I was man enough to say, well, I want the opportunity, and I'm looking forward to just fighting him for whatever I can get, just to get the opportunity to fight for a title. And so in this situation, Tyson got to do the same thing. I'm not saying that he's not a big draw, and I know that he's a big draw, but I'm the champion at this time, and if he wants the opportunity, then he has to fight on it under the terms of the, uh, the contract. There have been a lot of flies to your last two picnics. Uh, they were the two <laughs> biggest drawing cards in the history of the sport. <laughs> a lot of flies. You saw Tyson Ruddock one. What do you expect out of Tyson Ruddock two? Um, I expect a better fight. Of course, if uh, Razor Ruddock, you know, he fought last time with one hand, and I'm sure fighting with two hands, he should be better. And uh, I guess if Tyson fight the same way, then the fight can go either way. George, you have an opinion on Tyson Ruddock? I didn't see the first one, but 
They're both great fighters, so why not look forward to a great fight? All right, let's do. And let's turn to Yonkers, New York, where we have, uh, I'm told, a highly amusing question for Big George. Yonkers, you're on the air. Yeah, this is Bob Kenny from Yonkers, New York, and this is for the former champion, George Foreman. George, what do you plan to do with the money you made, and are you going to pay your cheeseburger bill when you're done? <laughs> I can tell you this. I've made enough money to buy my own fast food uh, franchise, chain anyway. And it's going to be a success because I'm going to buy all the burgers myself. <laughs> hey, there's a suspicion that some of us harbor that uh, some of this cheeseburger stuff is hype. That, in fact, you're not crazy enough mm -hmm. to have spent all of the last six months eating cheeseburgers, pizza, and ice cream, and that there had to be a high percentage of fish and poultry mm -hmm. and complex carbohydrates in that diet. How yeah. true is that? Turnip greens. Turnip greens. With turnips, <laughs> cornbread, crackling bread, chitlins, pork chops with gravy. Rice. You hungry, Evander? <laughs> that's Turkey my type of food. Dressing. I know that's your type of food. That's the type of food oh, they eat in Montebello, Alabama. Gentlemen, let's turn our attention to Montebello, Alabama, where they might be eating chitlins tonight. Montebello, what's your question? Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to ask a question to uh, Evander Holyfield. I've been uh, watching him since uh, his Olympic, uh, I guess, debacle is the best word for it. And uh, I've noticed since, uh, I guess it was the Dokes fight when I first saw it, that uh, when he fights in the middle rounds of long fights, he seems to take the uh, the beginning of the round off and then flourish at the end of the round to uh, win win that round. Uh, I was wondering if that's an intentional move on his part or is just unconsciously he does that. Well, you know, my strategy is to go into each and every round to take the lead, but uh, look forward to the middle of the round when a guy, a lot of time my opponent think I'm hurt because I'm moving around. They feel that, well, if he's not punching, something's wrong. And a lot of time I want them to think that and they waste a lot of unnecessary energy. Then coming the last 30 or 45 seconds, I'm able to catch them with a lot of good shots. If not knock them out, the next round they come in with their mind all bent because of uh, the punishment that they took in uh, the previous round. George, uh, when Sugar Ray Leonard came back to defeat Marvin Hagler after a lot of time off, he employed the strategy of flurrying in the last 30 seconds of each round and conserving energy and uh, using that tactic to impress the judges. Did you consider something like that? He, they want to win by points. Yeah. They can actually rehearse in the gym what they're going to do in a fight. All I do is knock people out, and how can I rehearse that? I didn't want a decision. I didn't want to win a decision. I wanted a knockout. And until, the final, until the final bell ringed in the 12th round, I was still seeking a knockout. George, That's what I was trying to George, do. George, if you had fought in your present style, which is more relaxed and purposeful than you did when you were younger, how much of a better fighter would you have been? It's hard to say because I, I became heavyweight champ of the world, so it all was not wrong. Right. I was successful to a certain degree. I fought great fighters like Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. Even on your best night, the only thing they can whip certain guys like that, even Evander Holyfield, is time itself. Not so much as what you do. My style fits in for today. I may have been out of style. 15 years ago. I, I personally am of the opinion that tactically you're a considerably better fighter than you were at that time a long time ago. Uh, and there are some who say it would have been interesting to see this fighter in that body. But this fighter goes with this body, right? This fighter goes with that body, and this body is the body of the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, we're wearing out the phone lines, gentlemen, in Georgia and Alabama, but let's keep it up because we're having fun. Huntsville, Alabama, the rocket town. You're on the air. What's up? Yes, hello. Um, I just wanted to ask Evander Holyfield how he felt about that typical George Foreman uppercut with the left hand, that one he walks in with, and then he throws that, that short left hook. Well, uh, that uppercut that he walks, steps in and throw, is one that almost got me. And because when he hit me, put a knot, an instant knot on my head right then <laughs> and there. And it was just a glazing shot. And uh, I pretty much knew for a uh, shot. That, that particular move for what he did to uh, Jerry Cooney. And, um, and I was watching out and trying not to get hit with that and get hit with the hook because uh, usually them are the shots that they usually take people out with. The man right. is skillful. Evander Holyfield, yeah. very skillful. As I listen to him speak now, I see he's a lot smarter than people gave him. Yeah, he, he didn't money. talk enough to satisfy you during yeah, the six months told leading up to the fight. To the boxing, man. <laughs> Let's go to Savannah, Georgia, as we continue in the Southland. Savannah, you're on the air for the last question of the night. Yes, uh, my name is Humphreys in Georgia. I'd like to know how the members of your church feel about you being a fighter. 
Uh, which, which fighter do you want to talk about that? Why don't we have both of them answer that, mm -hmm. since both well, of them are me. devout Christians? Yeah. George? Well, the strange thing about it, I preach in church all the time, especially the young people. If you want to be a boxer, wrestler, singer, dancer, go to church. There's no final place. Than, and the God that I serve is the God of I'll help you be the best of whatever you want to be, not the God of you cannot do it. I think after the fight, they were all relieved that old preacher man made it back and would be able to eat their fried chicken again. I guess now you can respond. <laughs> Evander? Well, you know, with me, I, I, was brought up, I brought up in church and I'm a very spiritual person. And I feel that, you know, the Lord do grant everybody the, uh, the opportunity to be their best in whatever they choose to be, what's right and what's fair. And uh, my church backed me, uh, Winston Village and New St. John and Mount Ephraim Voucher Church. All these churches backed me and a lot of people pray for me. You know, I thank God to be able to uplift his name and, and what I'm doing. Great. Gentlemen, your final thoughts. Uh, Evander, what do you think you will remember longest and remember best about fighting George Foreman? Well, I will remember that you can't take age for granted. Uh, and he proved something to me that it's the design, hard work that a person has to endure to be their best. And, I, you know, I wasn't looking at the age, the, the age factor. It's just the point of his desire that he wanted to win so much that that was called, caused me all that hard work because it's just that desire and termination that he believed that he can do it and I'm glad that you know he's a spiritual man. George your final thoughts. Final thoughts I got a chance to really read some fine newspaper articles after the fight for the first time my journalistic friends were saying good things not about George Foreman or Evander Holyfield but about the sport of boxing itself I'll never forget and I will always cherish that thought and be thankful for the journalists who spoke well of my beloved sport boxing. And gentlemen, we will never forget and we will always cherish what you gave us that night in Atlantic City and what you've given us tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you. Larry, it was a great night then and this has been a great night too. And I would like to add my voice to all of those uh, journalists that George refers to. Just imagine a fight that made everyone feel good. Everyone who saw that fight felt good and their words like dignity and class and fun and inspiring were thrown around to describe both of these fighters just imagine that well the fight wasn't like anything else in the end perhaps it was as one-sided as a sunny side egg yet always it was compelling and often very competitive a drama entitled the old guy hung in there took a beating but went the distance kept coming and trying. Evander Holyfield won the fight decisively. George Foreman won our hearts just as decisively. And that's the stuff of champions and heroes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And thank you, Larry. You know, one of the things that distinguishes boxing from all other sports is that so much of what we say and think about it is personal, subjective, unsupported, and undisputed by numbers and statistics. Discussion of Foreman Holyfield could go on for years, and surely in some quarters it will. Our aim this evening has been to help provide some fuel for that discussion, and we hope we've done so. We thank you very much for being with us. Good night. World Championship Boxing returns to HBO from Reno, Nevada on May 18th, when Hector Camacho takes on Greg Haugen in a 12-round junior welterweight fight. The executive producer of HBO Sports and the producer of Holyfield vs. Foreman was Ross Greenberg. The director was Mark Payton. The replay producers were Michael J. Whalen, David Harmon, and Brian McDonald. The associate producers, Kendall Reed and Kirby Bradley. The production manager was Russell Gabay. And the technical supervisor was George Wenzel.
has been a presentation of HBO Sports, the network of champions.